We are now live from Yukon, Oklahoma. All right. So, uh, as we start our, this has become now our normal way of preparing ourselves for a Sunday school class. And you should be doing the same thing when you go to any of the uh, Bible studies that you go to, or any time that you're going to sit down and start studying the Word of God, you should go through this process. And the process is a spiritual preparation. First of all, you prepare yourself to study the Bible by being in right fellowship. That's most important. Right fellowship with God the Father. And because, you know, we, we forget at times that um, even just coming to church, we could have some strong words to each other that maybe, uh, you know, the enemy is trying to stir up some, some garbage and... There could be something that happens even just on the way to church that can get you out of fellowship. Because the enemy wants to do that. So God has made a plan for us that's real simple. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's that 1 John 1, 9. That is a Bible verse that you need to memorize and use it daily. Because daily we're challenged to stay in fellowship. And oftentimes... Overt and covert sins occur. All right. Then the second uh, is a command. It's a, a command that says, be filled with the Spirit. Now, that's an interesting comment because I have spoken to a lot of Christians who have never even been taught about how to be filled with the Spirit. Or if you have a background like I do, I have a charismatic background. I come from the Assemblies of God and Foursquare. Yeah. <laughs> and so they also have some misunderstandings around what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit. And so they, it's real simple. When you confess your sins and you're cleansed, you are now ready to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And the filling means to be under the control. See, it's not like a glass that you fill it up with water and you're halfway filled with the Spirit. It's not like that. Or you fill all the way up to the top. Or you let it overflow. Those are stories that people use to try to give you an illustration of being filled with Spirit, but they're all incorrect. To be filled with Spirit is real simple. To be under the control, the guidance, and the influence of the Holy Spirit. That's what we want when we get into the Word of God. We don't want to be under the influence of our old sin nature. We don't want to be under the influence of the, the natural mind. We want to be spiritually minded and led by the Holy Spirit. And then the third part here is second. Oh, by the way, that be filled with Spirit is out of Ephesians chapter 5. Be filled with Spirit. And at the same time, it also says don't be drunk with wine. Which is interesting because, you know, in the early church, they did that. They would get together and thought that because they were feasting and they were drinking wine, they were under the influence of the wine. They said, oh, yes, yeah, so it's the spirit moving on us. No, that's not what that was. So he says, don't be a drunkard, but be you feel the spirit. All right. And then the third part here is focus on the scriptures. This is 2 Timothy 2.15. This is the Awana verse. It's actually what a word Awana means, which is the acronym. And it means a work person who has studied to show themselves approved. Workmen not needing to uh, be ashamed. So each and every one of you is called to be a student of the Word of God. Maybe you're not a, a teacher, but every one of you is called to be a student and to study to show yourselves approved. So that's what we want to do now. I'm going to take a few moments let you uh, privately before the Lord. If you have to do a rebound, a confession, do that privately, and then we'll get started in a moment. Father, thank you so much for your word that you've given us that we can study and we can be prepared for anything that comes toward us because you also have given us the Holy Spirit that guides us and you have also given us the word of God that's our sword and you have given us the promise that we can always confess our sins and be right with you. So uh, Father, we just thank you so much that you have done so much for us. May you be glorified in this teaching this morning, and we're asking this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Okay, uh, so some of you weren't here last week, and we also stopped last week 
toward the end and we allow Toby to come in and talk to us about our class. So I'm going to do the overview again. We're going to go through it quickly this time. And so for those who weren't here, you'll see what you missed. And uh, if you need to take notes, just get it from the recording. Because <laughs> I'm going to go fast through the first verses 3 through 8. Because at, at 7 and 8, right around there is where we stopped. And then we'll pick that up this morning. And then we'll go further. We're going to go all the way from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to start with 3 through 8. We're going to go through this pretty quickly. And then we'll pick it back up and finish all the way to 12. All right, so there's a lot. We're covering one morning. Okay, so with that, I have to give you a warning. If you weren't here last week, I also gave a warning last week. Adult content is to follow. That means that some of you may find the following discussion about sexual immorality to be offensive. And please feel free. It's okay to leave if you feel like, okay, you don't want to, you know, don't want to hear anymore, you don't want to participate, or it's sensitive matters, and I'm pretty blunt. So I give the warning, also because we're recording this, I want it out on the internet, and you have to give a recording as well, uh, a warning out there. But uh, if you feel in, any type of uncomfort, uncomfortable, feel free to get out, it's okay. I won't think anything about it, I'll just feel like, hey, God's at work, and we will continue moving forward. All right, so adult content is a warning coming forward. All right, so starting with verse 3 in 1 Thessalonians 4, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you before and solemnly warn you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So, what we talked about last week, and I'm going to go through pretty quickly, is the Roman Empire was such that Sexual immorality was a normal culture. They grew up with um, having no concept of what we call sexual purity today. Their concept was that um, there was nothing wrong with having extramarital sex, adultery. There was nothing wrong with homosexuality. There was nothing wrong with bestiality. A lot of horrible things that we all would look at and go, oh my gosh, how is that possible? But they didn't see any morality issue with that at all. And the culture was such that uh, even children who grew up lived right next door to pagan uh, temples. And in those pagan temples were prostitutes. And sex took place in, as a form of worship in those temples. Shocking, but that's what that culture was like. And we know from ancient writers such as Demosthenes that he said the following. We keep prostitutes for pleasure, we keep mistresses for day-to-day -day needs of the body, and we keep wives for the faithful guardianship of our homes, all at the same time. So it was, it was not a good situation. And when Christianity came in, and Christianity was teaching something different, it was shocking to the Christians who were in that church that they had to live by these new rules. We're like, really? Yeah, that was for them. It was their culture. And therefore, you know, they were constantly at odds with the problem of sexual immorality. And even, you know, Paul, he was writing this letter from Corinth. And right down the road from him was this temple that was dedicated to Aphrodite. And that was a temple where there's over a thousand prostitutes that were priestesses and priests, because they had male and female prost uh, prostitutes in that temple. So he would be writing this knowing that right down the road, this is all taking place. So even in the church in Corinth, um, it was an issue, but he's writing this letter from Corinth to that church in Thessalonica. All right, and so we, we found out from verse three, four, and we found that word four, of course, is a very important word. He's asking you to pause and think about what I'm about to say. 
is a time to ask the Holy Spirit, why is this important? He says, this is the will of God, and he makes it very clear. It's not what Paul is teaching. It's what God is teaching. And then he says, you're sanctified. And actually, this is a continuous process. In your sanctification or in your sanctifying, you're going to be set apart. And because they're set apart, they are to do something different than the world. And a part of that is their sexual uh, conduct. That was very important. Of course, uh, last week I went into more detail, so you can watch that video. As I said today, this is a refresher, just kind of get you up to speed on it. And he says that you are to abstain from sexual immorality. That abstain is in the middle voice and it's present tense. That means the following. I am responsible for how I behave and I'm to do it all the time. I'm to abstain all the time. It's a continuous process. And so he says the believer is to continually hold oneself or keep oneself away from contact or influence of anything that causes sexual immorality. So the question becomes, what is this immorality? So sexual immorality means the following. Made it pretty obvious for you. And I'm, I put a list there. There's more on that list than what I put up there. But the list is, first of all, no extramarital sex. That means no messing around if you're married with other people. No premarital sex. That means no making out in the backseat of the car. No prostitution. No homosexuality. No bestiality or any other type of sexual perversion that goes against God's plan. Pretty basic. So, he says that each one of you know how to control your body. So this indicates that you, yourself, are the one who's responsible for this. That you are to make sure that you uphold these uh, moral um, standards. And he tells us it's your body, and the word here for body, we spent some time on that last week. We talked about, in some of your Bibles, it says a vessel. And this, it is truly, the, the Greek word here is the word for vessel. And vessel is um, something that uh, is used for a specific purpose. So he's telling them, your body, sex itself, has a specific purpose in God's plan. So we have to discover what is that purpose then. You know, and some, uh, some in the church, uh, like in our, our Catholic uh, brothers and sisters who believe in the Lord, they will say uh, sex is only for procreation, for having babies. But that doesn't make sense since God gave us pleasure to go with them. Okay, so if that was the only purpose, then that's only half the purpose of what God uh, produced for us. So there's more to sex than what we've been hearing. And as we study this, we learn more about that. But notice it also says that you are to control your body in holiness, which is that sanctification word, and in honor. So we studied last week that the word honor here means that there's a value that God has placed on your body. It's so valuable that he says there's a resurrection coming where you get a new body. The body is very important. So you have a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a body. And the body's not going to go away after you die. It doesn't go in the grave and gone forever. He says there will be a resurrection you're going to get a glorified body. So the body has an important function. And a lot of Christians have no idea. They don't give it much thought. We're going to give it a lot of thought. Because we're going to spend quite a bit of time as we continue on chapter 4 and 5. He's going to talk more and more about our bodies being resurrected. So it's going to be fascinating to see about the great catching away. And what happens to the body. I call that the science of immorality. We become immortal. Immortality, I meant. Yeah, not immorality. Thank you. Yes, immortality. All right. Uh, very good. Add a little humor to Sunday school. All right. So then we find in verse 5, he says, not in the passions of lust. And we found out that the word passion is not our normal word that we think about in English. It actually means to have the mind uh, under suffering. It's, you're being driven. And so the word for passion is an affection uh, of the mind. It is a, 
uh, you can't find satisfaction, there's no rest. And he says, don't let this passion of lust, and lust here is a word that can, uh, it has no connotation of positive or negative. It's a neutral word. You can have lust for God, and you can have lust for sex. One is good, one's bad. And so the connotation is based upon the context in which it's being used. And so this word, uh, the epithemia, is to denote the presence of a strong desire or an impulse and a passionate craving. And the word passion, you put those two together and you got this person who is just totally driven. And so in modern times, we might say sexual addiction. Okay? But it's a lust. And he says, don't let that happen like it does for the Gentiles. What is that all about? The Jews don't have this problem. <laughs> so uh, the word here for Gentile ethos is talking about nations that are not godly believers. So those who are godly, there's a different control for people who are godly. But those who are not godly, there is no control. They just are rampant in their sexual immorality. So we see here some hints to us that God has provided a way for the Christians to be able to control this and why. And so we're going to see some of that as we go further into this word. All right, so verse 6 now says that no one transgressed or wronged his brothers. Now, why are we talking about the brothers in the church now? And the word for brothers can mean brothers and sisters. Okay, it's for both. Because what was happening was they were in a church where everybody was practicing sexual immorality. Yeah, it was right there in the church. And Paul's saying, don't be offending the other believers by seducing them, by getting them involved in perverted behavior, by enticing them to go back to the prostitutes across the street at that temple. So he's saying, do not let that happen because you have control of this. And therefore, he says, it's also something that's wrong. And wording for wrong means to do something greedily and selfishly. Because see, sexual immorality, sexual sin, is always focused on self, not on others. That's a surprise because, you know, if I talk to my college kids, they think that it's giving pleasure to others. No, no. You're doing it because of your own selfish desires. And we're going to find that out as we look further into this. Adultery is wronging because you're wronging the one that you've committed a trust with. And that trust has been broken. Premarital sex is wrong because you're, you're not even thinking about the soulmate, the right person that God's given you. And you're committing sex before that. And it should be saved for the purpose of that person. Now, if you have fallen into any of these... God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. So, he, you know, he's not telling them, oh, now you're just going to go to hell. No, he's telling them, you can confess, you can get right, but now going forward, apply the following. He's going to give them four things that will help them. Four ways of overcoming sexual immorality. Now, we also see, he says, that um, because the Lord is the avenger. I thought that was fascinating that um, people are always asking questions about, well, why does it matter? And, you know, if the whole culture is doing it, why not me? That's what they were asking back then. That church that he's writing to are asking that same question that we hear today. And we call that situation ethics. What's, you know, I, I can decide what's okay. And the rest of the culture is doing it. If they want to, you know, go see that movie, why can't I go see that movie? If they want to um, engage in sexual immorality, how come I can't? Just because I'm a Christian, I'm not allowed to? Why? What's, what's the issue here? He's going to be answering that for them. And this is a, something that should be brought up and regularly discussed in the church. Because this is Holy Scripture about teaching on this subject, which is, you know, Quite interesting that uh, most churches won't even approach, you know, won't approach us at all. 
All right, so it sounds pretty modern, uh, situation ethics and relative values. And he says here, the Lord is the avenger. And sounds pretty modern. And here's our four items. I told you I'm going pretty quickly because we've got to get to verses 7 and 8 and 9. All right, so we talked last week about the Lord being the avenger. God satisfies justice by inflicting due punishment. He then says that uh, God has not called you to be impure. He's called you to be sanctified, to be uh, set apart and holy. And he says, if we reject that, we're rejecting God. Wow, you're trying to make this really a heavy problem, aren't you? That's what Paul's doing. He's really helping them understand this is a serious issue. We're going to see why here as we go further. All right. And uh, so a couple other things here, just so you have this catching up. The avenger there is a word called the ekdikos. And the ekdikos is a person who goes out and, and will administer justice, and they will punish the wrongdoer. The ekdikos. And the ek means um, outside of, and dikos means justice. So outside of justice, meaning this. There's a person that says, you're out of justice, and I'm going to correct that. And God is the ekdikos. And then Paul says, hey, you know what? This is really serious business. He says, I solemnly warn you. This is not, you know, this is like one of those kind of warnings that should be in church all the time. Especially in our culture as we more and more become like the Romans. Everywhere we turn now, we've got homosexuality being pushed on everybody. We have, uh, they haven't started pushing bestiality yet. That was pushed in Romans time. But I wouldn't be surprised if that starts coming out in the news more and more. It's a subtle thing that starts to be added into the culture. And then 10, 15 years later, it's like normal behavior. Perversion. Satan has a way of doing that. He'll get in there and twist that. So Paul says, hey, look, I'm solemnly warning you. This is really this is really serious business. And I like what he said to the Galatians. In the Galatians, he says, stop being deceived. God's not mocked. For whatever man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. So we see that there are consequences. Now we're getting into today's study. That was, a co that was catching you up. So, shake it. <laughs> yes? Yeah, so the concept, yeah, so there's a lot of other perversions that we can bring up and talk about. And as you said, uh, it's, it's getting to the point now where, you know, children are being involved. And, you know, some, some places they're changing the laws about that too. And we're like, no, stand up against this. So I'm going to get on now to verse 7. And 7 going forward is our lesson for today. So we have spent the last about 15 minutes or so to kind of get you caught up. Which took us almost an hour last week because there's a lot more to say about it. So make sure you go back and watch the video. All the details were skipped. We just did the highlight today. All right. Verse 7 now. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. And it's interesting because the word impurity here is a word that uh, literally means worthless material. And it means waste. But also there's a medical way of using this word. So the medical way is a sore that's infected and oozing with pus and is decaying. And this word was literally used to describe the corpse that's decaying in a grave. And he says, God has not called you for that purpose. In other words, if you think of this image of oozing pus, decaying flesh in the grave, when you're thinking about committing the sexual sin, that's what he's doing now. He's tying those together. <laughs> All right? Paul's got such a way with words. He says, think of this picture now. Next time you want to commit some sort of sexual immorality sin, 
and you think that you're being tempted and you've got to give in to temptation, think about this. The old sin nature is wanting to lead you to death and wants to destroy the blessing that you have for others. Because remember now, the sexual immorality sin is all about being selfish. No matter what you think, it's, it's the old sin nature, selfishness. Now Paul's going to teach us how to do the love the right way. So he doesn't just leave us there with this bad notice and bitter taste in our mouth. He's going to give us some information. He's going to say, therefore. You know, whenever you hear the word therefore, therefore, <laughs> whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God. See, that means there's consequences. He's literally saying, consequently, he's emphatically introducing to his readers that there's now a logical conclusion after knowing that sexual immorality is that oozing pussy, de you know, decaying flesh. Instead, he's called you to holiness and honor, and he says, there is a change about to happen, and he's going to tell them that change. And what's interesting here is that if you were reading this in the Greek, You'd be coming along here and you get this word, therefore, and you're going to go, oh my gosh. He's like being really super strong about what he's about to say. This is like, you know, this is like someone yelling at you to get your attention. This word, therefore. It's a very, very strong Greek expression. And he says that such a person who is setting himself up in this place is saying that I'm God so I can make my own decisions. That's what's going on. A person who gets involved in sexual immorality is saying, I'm God. I can do what I want. My body, I do what I want. Even in the church, he's talking to Christians. Christians are involved in this. Even today, in modern day Christianity, Christians are involved in sexual immorality. Uh, our pastor uh, oftentimes talks to the men for the men uh, ministries. And he'll talk about the, the power of pornography and how that out on the internet is an addiction that grabs the mind of men and women and binds them. It's a powerful, powerful addiction that can be destroying. And they consequently see themselves as being in charge of themselves. And therefore they ignore the calling that they have. And he says, you can't say God is invalid. So he's going to go on and talks about it. He says, therefore, whoever disregards this not, does not disregard man, but God who gives. Now, I highlighted the God who gives because it's one word. Okay? And we have a comma in there. So we're kind of like, you know, God who gives. I mean, but actually, it means God the giver. God is a giver, okay? So God's a giver in the present tense. He's going to give them something to give them the power over the sexual immorality. There is something that's stronger, more powerful than we normally give credit to it. And what is that? It's the presence of the Holy Spirit. So what we have here, the standard of sexual morality is God's standard. He has given us the Holy Spirit to empower us. And if you are a, a believer who is in right fellowship and trusting God and, and willing to do what God says, he will give you the power to overcome the sexual sin. And by his spirit, God has given us the resources for that victory. If you are responsive to that resource. See, he doesn't force his will on you. But he does remind you. The Holy Spirit will help your conscience and say, you know, you know that this is, you know, a oozing, pussy, decaying flesh situation. Do you really want to do that? And get out of fellowship also. And then get the reaping of what you sowed. And in many uh, groups, many Christian friends will tell me, especially if I have a microbiologist in the room, they'll tell me about sexual diseases that are transferred because of things like this. Yeah. So we see that there's something else going on here that God is trying to protect us and get us into a sanctifying situation. So we have some principles before I go on to the new verses of 9 through 12. 
And the principle is, first of all, sexual immorality goes against God's calling. Well, we all know that now. It's obvious. But what about some applications? All right. The subject of sexual immorality is of the deepest doctrinal importance. It touches the very foundation of your Christian life. It's that important to God that he makes it a part of his word and he tells you, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit so you can overcome that situation. And then it says, an application is when God calls a believer, he divinely summons you to a new life, not to that old pagan life. And a part of that is the new life is not for the purpose of indulging yourself, but to move forward into sanctification. And therefore, every decision that we make should move us toward progressively becoming more and more holy. Every decision we make. A lot of Christians don't do that. They, they don't consider that the decision they're about to make is actually a part of the overall plan for how they become more and more like Jesus. Every decision, even small decisions and big decisions. All right, so... Let's get into verses 9 through 12. Oh, you want to talk about that? Oh, you want to write that down. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's being recorded. <laughs> I know. It takes you an hour to go catch up on it. So some of you may not know this, but you can actually on YouTube to fast forward and make it go faster and faster. You know, so you can get to the point where you didn't write your notes down. <laughs> oh, you can pull it along too. Okay, says the college student or the former college student. All right, she's a graduate now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get into verses 9 through 12. All right, so I know uh, 3 through 8 was pretty fast. I'll slow down now. Now, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, do this more and more, this brotherly love, and to inspire or aspire to live quietly, mind your own affairs, and work with your hands, as we have instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. All right, verses 9 through 12 is really full of a lot of stuff. There's a lot there. All right. So, um, let's start with the brotherly love. You're going to notice something interesting here. Verse 9, Paul's introducing now a new concept. He's been talking about sexual immorality and being sanctified. And now he's changing it and he says, now concerning brotherly love. In other words, it's like he's been trying to talk about brotherly love and told them, stop doing that in the church. Now, what is real brotherly love? What does that look like? So he's helping them understand there's a different kind of love than what you've been expressing. So we would use some Greek words like eros for erotic, erotic love, right? He's now using the word that we get the Philadelphia from. And Philadelphia is the, the, the city of brotherly love. Okay, so he's introducing now this brotherly love. And he says that this is a, a, a very... A very important time for them to work on their rapport and reciprocal love inside of the church. That this is a, a brotherly love. And what's also interesting, he says that we learned earlier that sex, sexual, uh, sexual sin was self-centered. But Christians, they experience a different kind of love. If you truly know the Lord, or if you've been around other Christians who are real Christians, there's a different kind of love being expressed there. It's, one, it's not one of taking advantage of each other. It's actually the opposite. And so he says, in, in, if you go to Romans chapter 12, it says here, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. So we're seeing that the other person is of more importance and that brotherly love is a, a different kind of love than what the world is sharing. Um, it's also interesting that God is teaching here a, uh, 
that there's something that we have innately. When you get born again and you have the Spirit of God in your life, there's something different about you. And a part of that is this kind of love that he's going to talk about. That we are to love one another and Christians are intuitively knowing this. Notice it says here, now concerning brotherly love, you have no one to teach you or write to you about it. For you already have learned this from God himself. Do you realize that? The Holy Spirit that resides in you is already teaching you about this kind of love. And that's the reason why, you know, Paul says, you already know this, but yet we don't stir it up inside of ourselves enough. All right, so he says, oh, and that's another thing here. Check this out. It says, now concerning brotherly love, and then you go a little bit further down, and it says, uh, taught by God to love one another. Those two loves, if you've got a Bible that has the Greek in it, are not the same words. There are two different words here for the word love. So the brotherly love, see, Translators help us out. They put the word brotherly in front of it. They actually would have said, Now concerning love, you have no need for me to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. But the translators are trying to help us. So they put the word brotherly in front of the first one because it's phileo, it's Philadelphia, it's brotherly love. And then in the second one is the agape, agapao, the love that is... Uh, uh, from God, God's love. And he says, look, God himself has taught you about his love. And we know later on in Galatians that it's also one of the fruits of the spirit is produced in our lives. So two different love words are being used here. And why does he say this? Why does he say that for God has taught you this? Well, let's see what Jesus had to say about it. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. We well, said it twice to me. It must be important. But by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And then when I was growing up as a teenager, I don't know if they do it anymore when you go to camp, but we used to sit around a campfire and sing a song, they will know we are Christians by our love. And I don't know if they do it anymore nowadays. But you know what? That guided me all through my high school years. They will know that I'm a Christian by the love that I have. And uh, that was important because I was a fighter. I was a, a kid that was, you know, before I became a Christian, I beat the snot out of you. After I became a Christian, I beat the snot out of you again. But now I do it out of love. No. <laughs> all right. No. But... I was into karate. I went to tournaments all the time. All right. And uh, so I learned that um, this kind of love is not the kind that the world can give you. But it's a commandment also. That was really hard for me. Because I said, well, why is he telling me I have to do this? Why can't he just say I'm making a suggestion? <laughs> I recommend that you love each other. No, why is he making a command? Because the old sin nature wants to fight against this. And he says, it's stronger than that. So make sure that you, with your free will, are engaging into this kind of love. The kind of love that uh, you're willing to lay down your own life, just like Jesus did. And let others be more important than you are. You're not selfish. See, the enemy, Satan, Lucifer, what was his sin? Selfishness. He wanted to, out of pride, rise above God. And he wanted to be God. And he was self-centered. And the Bible tells us that also from that, all these other sins have exploded. The sin to lie. It's based off of selfishness. The sin for sexual immorality is based off of selfishness. The, the sin of pride, selfishness, and so on. So all of these things wrap around. So what does God say? Love each other. The way that I love you, that means you're sacrificing. The agape love is a love that's not based off of how you perform. The object that you're loving, that object that I love, is not because of the object. When it's agape love, it's because of what I am. It's my character inside of me. I'm loving you because it's in me. 
that I love you. Not because you performed a certain way or you're saying certain words or you've got certain clothes on or you're attractive or anything else. It's all about the character of the Christian, not the object that you're loving. So we call this in Christianity, the agape love is a love that's based off of, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the theology word. It'll come back to me in a moment. But it's all about loving because you're making a choice not because you've been influenced to love. Yeah, well, unconditional love is, is a part of the agape. And that's how most Christians would say it's unconditional, but actually it's beyond that. It's the character of God himself that is in you that's loving others. So yes, but unconditional would be a good term for today. I'll think of the other one a little bit. All right. So we have some principles out of this. The first principle is there's a supernatural compulsion to love fellow believers. It's supernatural. It's from God. And we're compelled. Even if I don't like that person. See, there's a difference there. Do you get that? I don't like you. And, you know, Christians have this, this saying, I don't know if they really live it or not, but they say, you know, hate the sin, but love the sinner. All right? That's a real common one, especially in Baptists. They like to say that a lot. All right? And I, I've had some friends over in the Church of Christ, they like to say that also. But it seems to be, what does it mean to love the sinner then? Are you willing to correct them? <laughs> and I'm like, wait, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> no, see, the love the sinner means, are you expressing to them the love that God wants them to know? And you can't do that if you're not, one, in right fellowship with the Father, and two, built the Spirit, and three, been studying to show yourself approved. So it guards your mind, helps you do that kind of love. All right, well, application here. God himself teaches us to love one another. That means it's a divinely implanted into us a determination that we are to love each other. You know, I think that's what's happening here. Is that the Christians think because we're to love each other, we're supposed to love the sinner also. Interesting way of applying that verse. That's right. We don't exclude them. I still love them agape. I still do that. But see, it's almost as if we're not going to do it with each other because we're supposed to already. We're just going to focus on the non-believer and love them. No, love each other, you know, in the church. Be there to help each other, support each other. We're, you know, we're in this all together. All right, so we'll go a little bit further now, verse 10. Am I going too fast? All right, verse 10. For that indeed is what you are doing. See, these guys are doing something pretty powerful. For that indeed, the Thessalonians were already living this out. They were already doing it. He didn't have a reason to even write to him about that, but he's reminding them that you're already doing this. And that's good. And he says, where are you doing that? Throughout Macedonia. Throughout all of Macedonia. See, the Thessalonians loved the believers, even the ones that were in the Berean church, which was right down the road from them. The Philadelphian church, or, or Philippian church, I mean, the Philippian church, and down the road from there. But he says here, for that indeed is what you're doing with all of them. And then he starts a new sentence. But we urge you. We urge you, brothers. In other words, uh, Paul is wanting to get some momentum going in this area of love. Momentum. Are you reaching out to those that are not in your inner circle? Okay. Right, so now he's going beyond the Christians because he's going to start bringing up what happens in, what's happening in the community also. He's going to talk about in a moment, they're going to know you're Christians by your love. Are you reaching out beyond yourself and beyond your little clique? And if you're in a church, are you doing it beyond just those that you like to hang out with? Are you doing it for the whole church? And then a little bit, he's going to say, are you doing it out in the community? Because they're going to recognize you as a Christian by your love. He's going to talk about that in this chapter. All right, so he's trying to get them momentum going. Whenever Paul says, I'm going to urge you, I'm urging you, that means 
You're going too slow. <laughs> You're going too slow. Your love for each other is like a little spark. It's just kind of like, okay, it's there. And now it's spread out to the other churches in Macedonia. But I want to urge you. Yeah, he's going to like, like, what do they call it? A billow? A bellow? The, the, you, you, you pump it like that and it makes the fire go up higher and higher. Yeah, so he's going he's gonna to put some wind into it. Yeah. So he's going to add some wind, but first he's got to teach us a little bit about the principles of that. So God wants us to expand our love beyond the range of normal believers that we spend time with, as well as beyond just believers. And that's why I was coming back to it. You know, when we say hate the sin but love the sinner, what does that mean? Let's, you know, let's, let's go further in, in actually applying this. So the application, here's the first question for you then. How extensive is your love? Yeah, ouch. We got to bring it back to ourselves. We can't just keep this, you know, subjectively and generically out there. This is for other people? No. This is for me right now today, for Curtis, or for each of you. Put your name in there. How extensive is your love? Do you love certain people and no more? Because the love he's talking about right now doesn't have the limits. Agape love has no limits. If you put a limit on it, then you're not having agape love. You don't subject yourself. You don't become the... He's going to tell us in a little bit, don't let anybody take advantage of you. Okay? <laughs> Love is the ultimate tool for evangelizing and for spiritual growth, and for everything that God does, for God is love. And we need to recognize that. And then it says, as a believer, you have a fruit called love. And then it says, of all the things that he wants to teach you, faith, hope, and love, love is the most important. So he's putting a lot of emphasis on that and in the scriptures. But yet in the church, we talk about love, but it doesn't have the character-changing concept. Who you are right now. Does it change you right now? And therefore, we have to challenge ourselves with questions like this. Am I limiting who I love? Of course, I don't want to be taken advantage of. He's going to tell me that in a little bit. Don't let people freeload off of you. Don't give them money because they're in the church and asking for money. Anyways, he's going to give us some guidance here in a moment. Because apparently they had that problem in their church. There was a lot of freeloaders in that church in Thessalonica. We're going to see about them. All right. So he wants us to expand the sphere of those that we love. Consciously, think about it. Go beyond. And then the fourth one here is your heart has got to be overflowing. And that is, in my mind, and I wrote this down out of my own experience, one of the surest evidence of spirituality is that you're loving. And this morning when I was talking with our pastor, uh, it was really interesting because he said the same thing without reading my notes. He says, well, you know, our spirituality is reflected by how we love others. I said, that's good. I got that in my notes this morning. <laughs> yeah. So he pat me on the shoulder and said, all right, keep going. Well, so, you know, we need to recognize that an overflowing heart doesn't happen unless you're overflowing. Okay? If you just got a little bit, only a little bit comes out. But as you get into the Word, you see how much God loves you, it flows out to others. All right. So, you know, of course, then that means there's a memory verse. <laughs> Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such as these, there is no law. So write that down. Go off and memorize it. That's one that you should keep with you all the time. It actually guards your heart. And you know what's interesting also is it helps you know what you should think about. Yeah. I'm doing a, um, I'm working on my PhD right now. And I'm taking a class on strategic marketing. 
And I'm supposed to come up with a disruptive marketing plan. And I'm thinking, this is really disruptive. <laughs> uh, but I don't know how to make it into a consumer product. <laughs> All right. So let's see what else we have. Verse 11. Okay, now Paul is going to start telling you practically how to apply what your behavior is supposed to be like. What should you be doing to demonstrate this love and to make sure you don't put yourself in an awkward situation where you become the target for someone to take advantage of you, he's going to give you some practical advice. And the first practical advice he gives us is that there are certain members in the church that were fanatics, they were busybodies, and they were loafers. Three characteristics of people that were in the church. Fanatics, I come across this all the time. I get people who are the extreme, way out here in their passion for God and trying to get everybody to think the same way about God, the way they think about God. And if you don't like that, they're going to really get you down. They're going to uh, basically fanatically attack you, even though they're believers and you're a believer. So he says, you're going to have to be aware of this. And then there's also the busybodies. These are people who, no matter what, they want to know what's going on, and they want to tell everybody else what they know. And they don't keep to themselves. They always want to know, hey, what's going on? And then they want to spread it out. And so one of our terms we use is a gossiper, but I like the Bible saying busybody. All right. And then the loafers. Loafers, as I said earlier, is a group of people who do not want a job. They don't want a job, but they do want your money. Okay? And they may stand right outside the church door and wait for you to give them money. They may stand out at the street corner and ask for your money. If you're led by the Holy Spirit, that's different. You can give if God tells you. But recognize there's a whole category of people that the scriptures calls them loafers. Okay, so God recognized that. Now he says that there will always be those in this world who are in poverty. He says, help them. How do we help them? It's not by giving money. It's by jobs, training. Um, what we do here at our church is fantastic. We have a food pantry. We have medical for them. We got clothing. So we can help. But recognize also, God even puts a limit on what he does. And that doesn't mean I put a limit on it. That means I got to listen. God, what do I do? So we're going to see here, Paul has a prescription for these three categories of people. What's his prescription? First of all, he says, live a calm and orderly life. Yeah, this is a prescription now. Live a quiet life. See, because the fanatic is the one that's always out there, blah, 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 blah. they're constantly agitated, always looking for something that's bad, something wrong, trying to correct everybody in the world, and they're not living a quiet life. He says, if you are living a quiet life, the Holy Spirit is moving in your life and will do what needs to be done. So, live a calm, orderly life. Number two, ha, mind your own business. That's a pretty straightforward. It says, and mind your own affairs. I once had a, a person, wasn't in our church here, but um, I was a leader at another uh, ministry, and I had a person uh, that would come to me every week and tell me more and more stuff going on. And finally one day, I pulled out this Bible verse. I said, this says here, you need to be quiet and mind your own affairs. And work with your hands. I notice you don't have a job. <laughs> well, they never came back and told me anything again. <laughs> All right. And so that does bring up that third answer, manual labor. You know, if you're working with your hands, if you're working, you don't have time to be agitated, busybody, 
you are concerned about your job and, and the job that you're doing, the work you're doing. But what I thought was interesting is some of the principles out of the application. Christians use, who are usefully employed, they have a tendency toward being more settled. All right? And so the application then is turmoil is not from the Lord. Tone it down. Why get agitated and exaggerated with each other? Relax, pray about it, ask the Lord to work. Get worked up over trivial things. People do that quite often. You don't need to be doing that. And the quiet soul does not enter into rivalry with other believers. If you're quiet, if you're relaxed about it, and you're saying, okay, God. Now, you may have to stand up for something that you think needs to be corrected. You give your opinion. You pray about it. But you're not in a fight. Okay. And then Christians, why do Christians do this though? Why do they do those three things? Because they're trying to draw attention to themselves. They're running in selfish mode instead of other mode, living agape love. And sometimes they just want to promote themselves. So be aware of that. All right, let's see how much time we have. Oh, I'm just about out of time. Should I finish the one verse, verse 12? Or save it for next week? Go for it. All right. Verse 12, so that you may walk properly before outsiders. This is where we get back to how we're influencing those who are not believers. Okay? Properly. That's an interesting word here. That properly means that you're graceful, that you are becoming, and that you have a seemly manner. Right? Handsome. Becoming. It is a proper is a a way of getting a proper kind of attraction. It's, it's unbecoming to drain other Christians and to drive people uh, financially. And so he says, uh, live a proper life. And also, uh, Christian uh, Christianity, I have the word if, but it should be is. I misspelled. Christianity is not a license to relieve us from work or to live off of others' charity. Okay? not that's not Christianity we sometimes get confused by that because you know we have a heart and we want to help people but recognize a godless world looks upon those who leech off of others just as bad and so he says if you got people in your church that are leeching off of you the world sees that too and they don't like it so why should they join your church you know, why would they want they don't want that person leeching off of them also it's an interesting concept that everybody knew each other in those communities Okay, yeah, just like everybody knows each other here in Yukon and Mustang, and you, you can see, you know, things happening. Well, we have an influence on each other as a community. And it says, and be dependent on no one. That's an interesting concept. Contrary, our faith establishes the integrity of work and labor, so we know we should work, but also we know that if we do work, is unto the Lord. Our dependence is on the Lord, not on others. Now, we may need help, and we should help each other. But dependency should be on the Lord, not on, on each other. Um, so that's a hard concept, because in, in, in the church, we want to say, well, we should be able to depend on each other, because we love each other. Yes, but also our ultimate dependency is on the Lord, not on the other believers. Especially if you find some believers that are very, very rich. You know, they have a tendency to want to help. And it says here, make sure the person's got a job and that they're doing all the right things. So there's a balance there is what I'm trying to say. All right. So I'll bring up all of the uh, principles and applications on that one. We'll get them all up there at once. And so you can see here. Honest day's work is a testimony, and every Christian should have an honest day's work. Don't cheat your employer, and be sure that uh, people who you work with, they see you as someone who's really a, a good worker, not a, a loafer. Yeah. All right, so that covers it for today. Next week, wow, verse 13. Okay, if you look ahead to verse 13, it's like, whoa, man, we're going to talk about that. Yes, we are. 
We may have to talk about it for longer than just one day. All right. Father, thank you for your word. May we be challenged by it and pass the test this week that you have for us by applying these words in our lives. And may we truly be those who love each other the way that you love us and that we can also love the world and help them with your gospel, but that we will not become members of the world, but instead we'll be world changers with the gospel of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.